Blue Origin carried out another suborbital launch of its new Shepard rocket on Wednesday, testing its reusable booster and capsule system, which is designed to carry humans to the edge of space and back. Like the last 14 launches, no humans were aboard this time. But before the flight, two company employees entered the capsule to practice the procedures that future astronauts will follow before launch. After completing all pre-launch tests and inspections, on April 14, the 18 meters tall New Shepard rocket lifted off from Blue Origin's test launch facilities in Texas. The mission, dubbed NS-15, was meant to mimic what will occur once Blue Origin starts flying passengers. With a maximum ascent velocity of 3,615 km per hour, the capsule soared roughly 106 km above the ground after jettisoning from the rocket booster. The capsule carried the company's test dummy named Mannequin Skywalker and more than 25,000 student postcards. Parting with the capsule, the new Shepard booster fell back toward land and reignited its single B3 engine to touch down on the landing pad, about 3 kilometers from its launch pad. Meanwhile, the crew capsule basked in roughly three minutes of weightlessness at the edge of space before making its return roughly 10 minutes after liftoff. The capsule's descent was soft and slowed by a set of three parachutes before hitting the ground. The flight profile for the mission closely followed previous test flights. The key differences for this flight were the activities before and after the flight, as the company tested procedures it will use for later crewed flights. The mission involved Blue Origin's first upgraded New Shepard vehicle, known as NS-4 or RSS First Step, which first flew in January. The upgrades made this particular capsule the first to boast features like temperature and acoustic control, display panels, and a push-to-talk communication system. Blue Origin hasn't said when exactly it'll fly humans for the first time, and during the broadcast the company's spokespeople only said that the first crewed flight would happen soon. It also did not discuss when it planned to start selling tickets or what price they will charge. Last week, SpaceX won contracts to launch two separate lunar lander and rover missions on its Falcon series rockets. Astrobotic, a Pennsylvania-based company specializing in commercial lunar landers, announced it has selected SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket to launch its Griffin medium-class lander to the moon in 2023, carrying NASA's Viper lunar rover. Viper, or Volatile's investigating polar exploration rover is a NASA mission to explore permanently shadowed craters at the lunar South Pole region to determine if frozen water deposits exist there and whether they can support future crewed missions and colonies on the moon. Viper is planned to rove several kilometers, collecting data on different kinds of soil environments affected by light and temperature, and its total operation time will be 100 Earth days. In June of 2020, Astrobotic had won the NASA competition through the Commercial Lunar Payload Services program to deliver the rover to the lunar surface on its Griffin lander at a value of about $200 million. The task order specified that Astrobotic independently choose a launch provider. And on Tuesday, Astrobotic has signed a contract with SpaceX for the launch of its Griffin lander carrying the Viper rover on a Falcon Heavy rocket. As with previous Falcon Heavy missions, SpaceX will launch Viper from Launch Complex 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Astrobotic is responsible for end-to-end -end services for the delivery of Viper, including integration with its Griffin lander, launch from Earth, and landing on the Moon. Lunar exploration firm iSpace said on April 14 that it will transport the United Arab Emirates Rashid Moon rover to the lunar surface in 2022 on a Falcon 9 rocket. The Rashid rover will be transported to the moon on iSpace's lunar lander during the company's Mission 1, as part of its commercial program known as Hakuto R. The Emirates lunar mission will send the 10 kg Rashid to an equatorial locale on the moon's near side. The final landing site has not yet been announced. The little four-wheeled rover will study its surroundings for about 14 Earth days, using a high-resolution camera, a thermal imager, a microscopic imager, and a Langmuir probe. The Langmuir probe could help scientists better understand the electrically charged environment at the lunar surface, which is caused by the solar wind. Under the terms of the agreement, the Japanese Lunar Exploration Company will deliver the Rashid rover to the moon, provide wired communication and power during the cruise phase, and engage in wireless communication on the lunar surface. iSpace is also planning to launch its second lunar mission, dubbed Mission 2, in 2023, which will also include a rover deployment. This mission is also expected to lift off aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. 
Northrop Grumman Corporation announced on Monday that its satellite servicing spacecraft called Mission Extension Vehicle 2 successfully docked to the commercial communications satellite Intelsat Alpha 2. A Mission Extension Vehicle is a type of spacecraft designed to extend the functional lifetime of another spacecraft through on-orbit satellite servicing. MEV-2 was launched in August 2020 atop an Ariane 5 rocket from French Guiana in South America. It spent six months raising its orbit to rendezvous with Intelsat's 17-year-old communications satellite in geosynchronous orbit, more than 35,000 kilometers from Earth. That satellite was running out of fuel and was getting old. It had operated far beyond its expected lifespan while still providing broadband communications to three continents. On March 12, the MEV-2 craft started a month-long docking process with the Intelsat satellite. Docking was completed and confirmed successful by Northrop Grumman on April 13. MEV-2 is currently clamped to the back of Intelsat, serving as the satellite's life support by providing renewed power and navigation control. The two will operate as a combined stack for the next five years. After that, MEV-2 will undock from Intelsat and set off to rendezvous with another client satellite. MEV-2 follows in the footsteps of its predecessor MEV-1, which connected to a different Intelsat satellite on February 25 last year. Servicing an on-orbit satellite in this way was a space industry first for a telerobotically operated spacecraft, as satellite servicing had previously been accomplished only with an on-orbit human assistance in the several missions to service the Hubble Space Telescope. The U.S. Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, selected Blue Origin, General Atomics, and Lockheed Martin to develop competing spacecraft concepts for a demonstration of nuclear thermal propulsion. Under a program called DRACO, short for Demonstration Rocket for Agile Cis Lunar Operations, the three companies will aim to design nuclear thermal propulsion systems and spacecraft concepts for a potential demonstration above low Earth orbit sometime in 2025. Nuclear thermal propulsion uses a nuclear reactor to heat propellant to extreme temperatures before expelling the hot propellant through a nozzle to produce thrust. Compared to conventional space propulsion technologies, NTP offers a high thrust-to-weight ratio around 10,000 times greater than electric propulsion and 2 to 5 times greater specific impulse than chemical propulsion. DARPA awarded General Atomics a $22 million contract to develop the nuclear reactor. Lockheed Martin's contract value is $2.9 million and the Blue Origins is $2.5 million. The first phase of the program will last 18 months and will focus on General Atomics reactor and propulsion subsystem concepts. In the second phase, Blue Origin and Lockheed Martin will independently develop spacecraft concept designs. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Outfitted with hundreds of upgrades relative to late full-size predecessors, Starship serial number 15 was rolled out to the launch site on April 8. Four days later, on April 12, SpaceX conducted the first cryogenic proof test of SN15, with liquid nitrogen testing the integrity of the methane and oxygen fuel tanks. As a result of the cryo test, the 50 meters tall spacecraft developed a coating of frost, as its extremely cold tank section quite literally freezes the humid South Texas air onto its steel skin. On the next day, on April 13, a second cryo test for the header tanks was performed by the SpaceX team. Header tanks are meant to store propellants specifically for Starship landing. A notable first-time difference for this test campaign was the inclusion of a hydraulic ram under suborbital launch pad A to simulate the thrust forces from Raptor engines on the underbody of Starship while under pressure during the proofing tests. The ram was removed and transported back to the build facility in the early morning hours after the second test, which seems to indicate the completion of the cryo-proof campaign. On April 15, Raptor engines serial numbers 54, 61 and 66 were transported to the launch site from the Starship build site. Hours after arriving at the test site, workers installed two of the three engines onto serial number 15. Later, one of the three Raptors that arrived at the launch site was taken back to the build site for some unknown reason. This could be Raptor serial number 54. Musk had previously said that SN15 will be the first Starship prototype to fly with upgraded Raptor engines. Check out our previous video to learn about the SN15 upgrades. After arriving at the launch site, prior to the cryo-proof tests, workers installed more heat tiles onto the belly of SN15. 
This increased the total number of heat tiles on SN15 from 829 to a higher number. The most unexpected update about SN15 is that the spacecraft has a Starlink dish antenna attached. If the Federal Communication Commission approves, SpaceX will use its internet service during the upcoming flight test. SpaceX founder Elon Musk envisions utilizing Starlink internet communication on board moving vehicles, like aircraft, vessels at sea, large trucks, even on board the Starship spacecraft in transit to Mars. In a new FCC filing, SpaceX requests special temporary authority to operate a single-user terminal within 5 kilometers of Boca Chica village on an experimental basis at altitudes not to exceed 12.5 kilometers. In SpaceX's request, the company asked for the 60-day test period to begin on April 20, which has led many Starship fans to speculate that this is the beginning of the flight window. A public notice has been issued for a temporary road closure from April 19 to 21, during which SpaceX will conduct the triple-engine static fire test of SN15, followed by a high-altitude test flight. A temporary flight restriction has been posted on the FAA website, restricting aircraft operations within designated areas around Boca Chica on Tuesday, April 20. A recent tweet from Elon Musk confirms that the test flight will take place this week. Recently an FCC license has been posted for the next six months, with the purpose of experimental hops and recovery tests of the Starship with a maximum altitude of 20 kilometers. The license hints that future Starship test flights might have an apogee of 20 kilometers. Recently, NASA selected SpaceX as the sole company to win a contract to develop and demonstrate a crewed lunar lander. Last year, NASA awarded $135 million to SpaceX, $253 million to Dynetics, and $579 million to a national team led by Blue Origin to develop a lunar lander for the agency's Human Landing System program. They asked each of these companies to develop an innovative landing system to be used under the Artemis program to ferry astronauts down to the lunar surface. On Friday, NASA announced that SpaceX had beat out the other two competitors, winning the $2.9 billion for the development of the Starship vehicle and two flights. One of these missions will be an uncrewed flight test of Starship down to the lunar surface and back. The second mission will be a crewed flight from lunar orbit down to the moon. As part of the Artemis program, SpaceX has proposed launching a modified version of its Starship vehicle to lunar orbit. Once reached the lunar orbit, Starship would rendezvous with NASA's Gateway Lunar Orbiter. Astronauts who have been previously transferred to the outpost by NASA's Orion capsule would board the Starship and go down to the surface. After completing lunar exploration, Starship would then lift off from the lunar surface with the astronauts and link back up with the Gateway. The crew would then return to Earth in the Orion capsule. NASA was expected to choose two of the three companies in the running to build the lander, as the agency often has multiple providers to ensure a backup and to keep the energy of competition. However, they have chosen to go ahead with SpaceX alone. According to NASA, Starship offered several advantages. It has a spacious cabin for astronauts, two airlocks, and ample payload capability to bring large numbers of experiments to the moon and return samples to Earth. Significantly, the NASA engineers also praised the vehicle's innovative design and future-looking technology, which might also one day be used on Mars. Ultimately, the selection criteria were based on a company's technical proficiency, management, and cost. SpaceX scored well in all three. Now, let's discuss what's happening at the Starship build site. Starship serial number 16 is taking shape inside the midbay. Tank sections were transferred into the midbay for stacking operations. An SN-16 tank section with heat shield tiles attached was spotted near mid-bay last week. We can expect a lot more heat tile on serial number 16 compared to that of SN-15. SpaceX's Super Heavy Booster Pathfinder, Booster BN-1, was quietly being disassembled in the middle of the night on April 12, confirming Musk's stated plans to scrap it as a production pathfinder. Mystery nose cone test rig work continues at the build site. Recently the nose cone cage received a top hexagonal frame. Check out our previous updates to learn more about this test rig. The forward dome of ground support equipment tank number 3 has been stacked at the construction site last week. GSE tank 1 is already installed near the orbital launch pad, and GSE tank 2 is currently inside the midbay along with Starship SN16. 
Now, let's take a look at the current status of various Starship prototypes, with the help of this illustration from Brendan Lewis. The common dome and forward dome of serial number 16 got mated last week. The common dome of serial number 20 and the forward dome and aft dome of Super Heavy Booster BN2 got sleeved at the build site last week. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.